Hello, Mark Fletcher here with something just a little bit different. I wanted to share with you a project that I've been working on for the last four or five months. This is one of those bucket list projects that I've been planning and thinking about for, I don't know, 30, 35 years now. I've always had a passion for 18th century furniture, and particularly the work of Thomas Chippendale. In the early 90s, I bought a book called Masterpiece Furniture Making by Franklin H. Godsall. I loved the book so much that I ended up tearing the cover off of it and three-hole punching it and putting it in a notebook so that I could take the pages out so I could study the drawings and take them to the shop. I guess you could say that Mr. Godsall has become one of my mentors. There were two pieces in the book that I particularly loved. The first one was the shell top corner cupboard. Because I was working full time at the time, I just didn't feel like I'd had the time to put in build the other project, so I decided this one was a little less challenging. Maybe I could squeeze it in. Well, it only took me six years. Between having a child and building a house, I finally brought the finished product in the house the day just before Hurricane Fran came roaring through the Raleigh area. So we refer to this cabinet as our Hurricane Fran cabinet. That was 1996, and it just so happens that that very year, Mr. Godsall died. So here is my interpretation of Mr. Godsall's shell top corner cupboard. The other project was this Philadelphia Chippendale High Boy. I've always wanted to build a high boy, but I just never felt that I had the time to take it on. But since retirement, and since we had such a horrible 2020 year, uh, along about Thanksgiving, I decided I'm going to do it. So to get started, I needed to make sure that I could get the materials that the project required. An important one was the availability of the period reproduction hardware. When I had done the corner cupboard, I bought my hardware from a company in Exton, Pennsylvania called Ball and Ball, who did beautiful work. Problem was, that was 30 years ago, and who knows if they're even in business anymore. So I looked them up on the internet, sure enough they were there, there was a phone number, I gave them a call, and the lady said, do you have an account with us? And I said, well, then 30 years ago, after I explained to her what I was getting ready to do, she said, oh yeah, we can, we can take care of that. The next thing was the lumber. The project called for mahogany and poplar, and those are woods I use a lot, so I had most of what I needed up in my loft. However, the legs and crown molding called for three-inch thick mahogany, and I was a little bit worried about that. So I took a trip over to the lumber yard where I buy my materials, and lo and behold, sitting off to itself, as if it was waiting for me, was a beautiful piece of 3 inch thick by 10 inch wide by 9 feet mahogany plank. And with no further thought, I grabbed it up and told the guy to measure me up. The guy at the checkout said, you paid $600 for a single piece of wood? I said to him, well, I'm a total commitment kind of a guy. And with that, I'm building a high boy. Mr. Godsall provides fantastic drawings in all of his books. And I spent an entire Saturday photocopying the pictures of the carvings and then scaling them to 100% so that I could transfer the drawing directly to the piece of wood. There were five patterns for the relief carving, which consisted of the knee carving and claw and ball foot for the legs, the carving across the front apron of the base cabinet, two rosettes on the crown molding, and the carvings on the lower and the upper center drawers. Once I was sure that I had my patterns at 100% scale, I made extra copies of the legs and then cut them out with scissors so that I could make a template of the cabriole shape of the legs. So now I'm ready to go to the shop and make my first cut on this $600 piece of mahogany that I bought, which starts with cutting out the legs. Now the leg actually extends all the way up to the top of the base cabinet, and that top portion has to be notched out and becomes the styles of the base cabinet. Now that I have the leg blanks made, I'll trace the cabriole template onto the leg blank and then cut it out on the bandsaw. After that, I'll choose a piece of five-quarter mahogany for my apron and trace the apron carving onto the board using some carbon paper. Once that's done, I'll use a router to drop the background around the carving. Then I'll glue up the two ends for the base, 
make some mortise and tenons and cut out the notches in the legs to receive the corner columns. Now I'm ready to start shaping the legs. I start by gluing the two wings on each leg and then shaping them down with a number 50 cabinet rasp. After that I'm ready to start carving the claw and ball foot. This picture shows the progression from right to left. The leftmost leg is the finished carving. Once that's done I dry fit everything together to make sure everything fits right. Next I'll trace the knee carving pattern on each of the legs and then carve them out. After that's done I'll then do the apron carving. Then to finish up the construction of the base I'll glue the legs to the end pieces and then make the rails and styles for the drawers. Building the internal framework for the drawers will finish construction then of the base cabinet. I start to work on the upper cabinet with the layout of the pediment board and then glue up the two sides. Then using a dovetail cutter on my router I cut the rabbits for the drawer dividers. Finally I lay the two end pieces side by side to assure perfect rabbit alignment. Next comes the drawer dividers. After framing those up I found it interesting that Mr. Gottsall did not include any dust panels in these frames. I just can't build a chest of drawers without dust panels so I had to include that modification. Once the pediment board is cut out and the drawer dividers are complete, I'm ready to fit the sides. Being careful about wood expansion, I only glue the sides at the front of the cabinet but make slots for screws at the back so the sides can move a little bit to account for expansion and to prevent splitting. Adding the two styles for the center drawer completes the construction then of the upper cabinet. Using the 3 inch mahogany board I bought, I was then ready to build the crown molding. I built a jig the shape of the molding and making a series of bushings for the various router bits that I'm using, I can now shape out the molding. This uses up most of the $600 board. After making the crown molding, I glue up four 1 inch mahogany strips with brown paper in between in order to make the quarter columns. Now the purpose of the brown paper is so I can easily split the pieces back off and use two of them as the quarter columns. Then I mount the assembly in my lathe and turn the column. After the column is turned, I mount a fluting bit in my router and make the flutes while the work is still mounted in the lathe. After that I'll do a shorter column for the base cabinet. Finally I split the columns into their four quarters and then choose the best looking pairs and toss the other two. After the quarter columns are complete, I return to the crown molding and carve the rosettes. After this I make the molding around the bottom of the upper cabinet, mount the crown molding, and then install the quarter columns. After installing the quarter columns on the base cabinet, this completes the basic construction of the cabinet. Using what's left of my 3 inch mahogany board, I'm now ready to make three flaming finials. Once I turn the finial, I leave it in the lathe and then carve out the flames. Because I have three finials to make, I have to repeat the process now two more times. So here's what's left of my $600 board. Now before I proceed with the drawers, we want to do a final sanding and get out all scratches and tool marks. Now it's time to make drawers. I carefully measure and cut out all the drawer fronts first. Then I mark off all my dovetails, 240 of those suckers. Now because the dovetails on the drawer fronts are blind, I have to cut those out with a chisel. The pins are a little easier, I can cut those on the bandsaw. After dry fitting each drawer assembly, I'll then cut my grooves for my drawer bottoms. I can then put glue on the pins of the dovetails and glue them up. After the glue dries, then I carefully fit each drawer, making sure that there's perfect alignment and they slide in and out very smoothly. This is a very time consuming part of the process and I'm really glad when it's over. The final part of the construction is the carving of the two small drawers 
one in the center of the base cabinet and one in the center of the upper cabinet. I start by laying down some carbon paper on the wood and then lay my pattern on there and trace it out with, on a, with a pen just like I did with the, the legs and the crown molding. Now these drawer fronts are a little different than a normal carving in that there's t actually two layers. So I carve out the first layer first which is the leaves that go around the edges of the drawer front. Then I drill a hole which is the bottom of the second layer of carving and that tells me where to stop with the second layer. Now the upper drawer is just a smaller version of the lower one so it's just a matter of repeating the process. And that is the final step before putting on a finish. Finishing an 18th century piece of furniture begins with using a nice dark stain. Once the stain dries good, I like to use tongue oil for a finish. It usually takes 10 to 12 coats of tongue oil with a good rub down with 4 alt steel wool in between coats. The way I test to see if I have enough coats is I rub my finger across the grain and if I can't tell any difference between running my finger with the grain, then I know I'm done. If you try to put on too many coats, it really starts to look built up. So you want to make sure and stop before that happens. And once I'm done with the tongue oil, I finish everything off with some Johnson's Paste Wax and really buff it out to a very nice smooth finish. One final step I like to do is what I call making a drawer pass the one finger test. Using sandpaper, files, Johnson's Paste Wax, whatever, you make that drawer slide in and out using just one finger in the corner of the drawer. I hope you've enjoyed watching this. I bothered to take all those pictures along the way so I thought well at least I ought to make a video. And who knows maybe you'll get inspired to build something. Thanks so much for watching.